We've got a little while for any wider questions on processes, outcomes, and any other questions that come to mind. So I'll take a few questions at once. I'll ask you to try and keep them to questions rather than debates or statements, if you can. Do we have, sorry, do we have a mic at the front as well? Can I ask for your questions here as well? Afterwards, okay, so we'll take to the two questions. Hi, uh, I'm Barry Rooney. I've worked with MSF for about 10 years uh, in the field as a volunteer on sleeping sickness. Sorry, we're not hearing you so well. Is the microphone on? Or speak closer into it, that might also be enough. Is it on? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yes. Hi, I'm Barry Rooney. I've worked for about 10 years in the field with MSF on uh, sleeping sickness. So diagnosing uh, sleeping sickness, as you may know, is, uh, involves lumbar punctures. Um, my uh, day job, as it were, is as a scientist in a lab working um, in biotechnology. So s the last couple of years, I've been working on, on making better RDTs and diagnostic tests. So bioengineering antigens based on the whole genome information that's there. So that's possible. And we need better, more specific antigens uh, and tests and new variants. Now, the, the problem that we, we have, and, and there's a group of us scientists without, uh, without borders who, who uh, work on this project. And the problem we have is getting, there's two, two issues, maybe Terry or whoever could address this. One is having availability of good uh, samples, so uh, biobanks, serum samples from field isolates, up to date, not isolates that came from 30 years ago. And then the other thing is obviously, when you make a prototype, is quickly testing it. And, and the gang, all the other speakers have addressed that. If you make a prototype, and we often make maybe 10 different things in, uh, in six months, we want to check them off really quickly. So that's uh, biobanks and access to, to those samples, which is, is a major issue. And the other then is access to field trials for prototypes. Thank, Thank you. you. And the question here, and then we'll go, there's a question at the back, if you, just at the middle. Yeah, so my name is Kieran from MSF. Uh, this is a mes uh, message, a question for Pete, <laughs> <laughs> uh, with a message in it. Hi, Kieran. <laughs> um, oh, dear. No, uh, so, Pete, the, the approach of uh, um, using Josie and Anup when they weren't actually in the field, that makes sense from the HR point of view, in that uh, uh, you're not pulling people out of the field to be part of a design team, but I wanted to ask, were there, did, did you feel there were any shortcomings in not actually physically running the whole design process in the field, um, and how did you overcome that? Okay, and then the last, actually, last question at the back. Yeah, Vanessa yeah. Stair from MSF. I was wondering with, do you ever have, for MSF Suite and the innovation team, do you ever have companies that come to you with their own innovations for the field? And um, is there any, I guess, conscious in, in working with these companies that might be in conflict with the work we're doing? Wonderful, thank you. So let's start with those three. I might turn to Terry first yep. on the first question around sleep and sickness diagnostics. Yeah, yeah. So you're certainly not the first person to have asked for this. I mean, I speak to many manufacturers and these are the two things they always ask. Can MSF help with samples and can they help test prototypes? Um, and I haven't had that much luck uh, intersectionally with this. Uh, so I think there's a broader question to ask of MSF. Do they want to get involved more upstream in both the design of products? So coming from the target product profile already, which as we've seen from the talks this morning has been hugely valuable. Um, do we actually want to wait until the product is launched and, and more difficult to redesign before we start going, oh, we wish you know, we could tweak that or do this? Um, so how much upstream do we want r to be involved right from the target product profile stage? That would be the easiest. And how much do we want to contribute to biobanks and prototype validation in our, in our fields and, and based on what? So, I mean, Episounds are already doing a lot. Um, for example, for the multiplex, they are they have biobanks and they have uh, they will contribute towards um, studies in the field, um, including prevalence studies. 
but uh, I mean beyond beyond that, uh, beyond the Episound sites, there's not such great um, availability. It's also quite difficult to have a biobank. I mean, you need big freezers. It's minus eighty. It's a lot of electricity. It costs a lot of money. There are other um, organizations like Find that work through other biobanks. So they just pay a fee to a professional biobanking organization like Zeptometrics, um, whose job it is to, is to hold these biobanks and, and ensure the quality of samples. Uh, but for Hep C, for example, they couldn't get any recent samples. I mean, manufacturers were battling to find anything before like 1997 in terms of sampling from blood banks. So it, it's a real problem <coughs> that I think we need a broader discussion in MSF on. Um, also, in terms of um, some of the, qu I just wanted to mention, I, I, I think some of these questions involving contract, how do we approach contracts with manufacturers and so on? Um, some of it might, might be that they've approached you because they want to do s f something for the social good, which is wonderful. But I think also it's about the leverage that we have. So how much are we putting into it? And so how much can we ask for? And I don't know um, how to define that very well, but if we don't want to have them to have a patent, if we want it to be open source, if we want it to be including all the access provisions we would usually want to see, that often comes down to how much leverage we have in terms of demonstrating how much we've put into it to, to ask for what we want. Yeah. So, so like, on, on that, uh, actually, uh, me and Pete have uh, just uh, just starting up a project uh, focused around uh, looking at the options for, for partnerships with commercial partners and also, like, IP questions. Uh, the aim being that we can better define uh, early on what we do want to get out of it in terms of licensing and, and putting these in place. And I think uh, we ran a, a workshop two days ago uh, on this, and just by seeing some of the current cases which we're engaged in um, and how advanced some of them are when it comes to IP questions uh, compared to some other ones where no sort of IP lawyers have been engaged and things like that. Uh, I think what we intend to do is like a mapping of some of the, the existing projects around the movement, uh, really to see where we are and, and the best way of moving forward to formalize that more. Anything to add from the panel on uh, access to samples and field testing before we move on? No? My so, question is so kind of on field question? testing anyway, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's important to note that although the participants felt it was a successful prototype, it was only a successful prototype. It's not a product because it hasn't been field tested. So this, this would need to happen. That would be part of the process. Um, Alan, the GD of Fearsome, uh, in the interview afterwards, had said beforehand he thought this was kind of the poor cousin of sending a designer to the field, having MSF staff come to the workshop. However, by the end, he'd actually flipped that over, and he thought actually it was much more valuable to bring the MSF experience in first so that you do have a prototype that you have a high level of confidence in before investing that kind of time and money and resource in you know, going, going to the field. So actually, I think it was a positive thing um, that, the, that it started outside the field. Interestingly, we completely shot ourselves in the foot because we'd planned in the in the project planning that the two MSF design two person MSF design team would also have a field partner in North Kivu who they could bounce ideas off. But obviously one of our barriers is that MSF staff don't have any time, so they didn't end up <laughs> bouncing any ideas back. Um, but actually even though even though that was the case, we're st still confident that this was the, the right the right way to go about this. Thank you. Okay, next batch of questions. Okay, so we have a cluster on this side, those three. Yeah. Okay. Me or? Okay. Um, yeah. Rafael from uh, MSF uh, Brussels. Um, I think a general question to the panel, would you say that MSF is a, is a good environment for innovation in general? I mean, we've got there four successful examples of or examples of successful innovation um, but then my inner epi yells reporting bias because you wouldn't be sitting here if you weren't successful um, so w would you say in general is this is this uh, the the four examples that you gave is this typical of your experience with innovation or are these kind of the cherry-picked successful examples and maybe as a corollary to that question um, is it are there certain cadres or um, 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 departments in MSF which are more 
um, amenable to innovation? I mean, is it more the medicals? I have the impression it's often the logisticians, the Watsons, which are the more creative ones. Um, is that a general truth, or is that is that my my personal uh, bias there? Thanks. Okay, so what do you think about that? Another two. Uh, Nils from Fearsome. I wondered, uh, Louis, if you had any feedback from the manufacturer that you work with on the, the value of um, the input from MSF Innovation um, and, and the stakeholders that you spoke to um, compared with their sort of usual process, the usual process they would set about designing a new product. There was one more question on that uh, left side. Uh, hi, um, Kira Anderson from Service Design Agency Snook. Uh, this is a question from for Andreas. Uh, I am a, an equal measure enthusiast and skeptic of hacks. I think as any that's been involved in one is, um, and and I, and I really agree with what you're saying about the um, the importance of follow up and sort of feedback loops. So I just wondered if you had any examples of outcomes from MSF hacks, not necessarily um, the innovations, but maybe. Uh, relationships, partnerships, and how you've supported those and how you've been able to, to move those forwards afterwards. Okay, and one last question from our online audience, I think. Yeah, we have uh, an online question for Pete Masters. Um, can you really expect a nurse or midwife with a good idea to also have project planning or management skills? Okay, so who Didn't would I like to that? kick off? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, my my gut response is that oh, MSF is that, that the R and D is not their core, and yes, this is kind of an exception. But then, just thinking off the top of my head, how many projects we're currently involved in with R and D or innovation, or have at least initiated and and have been taken up by others? I mean, we have the three Ps, which is the push pull pull for TB drug development. Um, we have DNDI. We have the mini lab for um, feasible uh, blood culture. We have the multiplex that I just presented. We have Child's Play, which is um, Epicel Pasteur collaboration for a pathogen test for fever diagnosis in children under five years. Uh, we have the Almanac, which uh, um, uh, Clotilde can tell you more about, which is for fever diagnostic on a tablet. It's a, basically an, an easy flow system for nurses to use, whereby all the complicated thought processing that would usually be done by a more um, specialized physician is built into the back end. And so you can simplify fever diagnosis on the front end. So there's actually plenty, and I think we can be very proud of what we've been involved in in much more upstream ways. Um, also, one example I wanted to give on the hackathon is actually a, the Access Campaign Office in, in the US had a hackathon um, to, to, to try and um, get shareholders who had pension, pension funds invested in, for example, Pfizer, um, as shareholders to put pressure on, on Pfizer to drop the price of PCV, uh, which was part of the Fair Shot campaign. So I'm sure others have other examples, but that worked pretty well. Louis, did you want to answer the question about your... Uh, yeah, so, um, so uh, that's quite an easy question to answer because uh, Ludovic is here. If you raise your hand, yeah, you can, you can speak to him and find out he's, for, he's from MDS, the manufacturer. Wonderful. So Andreas on, on hacks. Yeah, I, I would just uh, say that I agree. I mean, I'm also enthusiastic and skeptic. And I think uh, what I find when I talk to people about this, it's, uh, it's a mixed bag, to be honest. And uh, I don't want to like point out some specific uh, things, like this solution is a great example because people might, you know, hurt me afterwards. But, but I mean, you know, uh, the, the missing maps people, Pete and others with the mapathon. So obviously that's kind of concrete results. Uh, we had people reporting on, on body bags that are kind of, uh, have been designed and, and now are, you know, getting scaled up. Uh, IT systems, apps, uh, personal protective equipment and so on. But everyone, even those that are, would be considered successful, they point to the problems of implementation. So the prototype is not, you know, the implementation. The prototype, even with this, you know, uh, autoclave that we have in the field. It's not the final thing. Uh, it's quite a long gap or large gap even after that. So uh, if you can't sustain it, if you can't support this prototype, if you don't have a plan for how to scale it and how to support it, it's, uh, 
it's a nice prototype and it's a success, so to speak, as a prototype, but it's not the final solution. Yes. And Pete. Yeah, I'd just like to, for the epidemiologist, I think I, I think I agree. And I think last year at Scientific Day was the first time a failure had been presented. Um, and I think, you know, we have anecdotal evidence of failures and successes, but actually we don't really have any kind of view of a portfolio of MSF design and innovation. And it's something we're, we're actually trying to address. And that sharing of success, um, whatever, the, whatever that means, but also the lessons learned is, is, is equally valuable. So I think it's a, a, really, a, really, a really good point. And I'd just like to point out that we met Fearsome at a mapathon. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so next batch of questions. So we have a gentleman here and a lady here. I'll take those two first. OK, um, I'm Jeff from uh, MSF, and I have a question for Terry. Is that uh, for the pathogens identification, is there any um, opportunity, uh, maybe in the future, to look also at pathogens in water? Uh, because here it's all for, for, for patients, which uh, I think is OK, but also for, for water in hospitals, especially where we have outbreaks, that might be uh, something to consider. Thank you. And the second question was just a bit further up. Yes, uh, Sylvia from MSF, and I have two questions, one for Pete and one for Andreas. And for Pete, is how you see this, uh, the adoption of this innovation approach in, in MSF. And for Andreas, is related to the uh, scoping of the challenges. You said it's a key element. So did you see in the study some criteria of the type of challenges presented that are more suited for this type of uh, techniques? There are a couple more questions on this side. So, gentlemen, just here in the green. <coughs> Hi. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, I'm just a previous, uh, uh, I'm a previous MSF, now NHS. I'm a medical microbiologist. I'm very interested by uh, the Terry's talk. Uh, we are currently evaluating a multiplex uh, commercial PCR for uh, um, uh, viral and bacterial uh, infection on CSF. Have you got uh, uh, any? Um, partnership with big microbiology labs because we could help basically with you know any organisms on that list apart from probably the sleeping sickness sorry uh, so yeah I mean I just would like to to ask you that thanks and last one just a couple of roads forward this lady here hi I'm Aga from missing maps events team as this question for Andreas um, I was wondering we um, don't seem to have uh, much trouble generating the initial enthusiasm and interest in the project. But I was wondering if you had any insights on uh, how to then encourage people to take up more advanced training and kind of move up the, the ladder um, in, the, in a hackathon, makeathon, mapathon community. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions we'll get to answer. So, Terry, do you want to start us off with the two? Yeah, sure. Um, and the, so the initial uh, cartridge that is being envisaged is for patient use, uh, but really the sky's the limit. And, and one of the big reasons why we want this to be an open platform, uh, also because it, it's, it's uh, in line with MSF principles and uh, not having monopolies, uh, but also because it's very customizable, and any cartridge could be developed for anything. So we have to have we have to have very transparent. Um, uh, um, basically, we have to be very transparent in terms of how the instrument works, what is what what is the interoperability, how the cartridge will be designed, so that the molding would be standard. But then whatever you want to, to load on that is fine. And in fact, there are already prototypes like that, like the lab disk from the University of Freiburg. It's, it's already uh, following that concept. So it's not unprecedented. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and then the, uh, the partnerships, yes. Um, so there, was, there are, of course, some labs in MSF, uh, but the product development partnership would be with FIND. Um, and they already have very well established partnerships with key laboratories, and they're also contributing towards a biobank for fever um, from a globally representative um, laboratories and sites. 
Okay. So I'll go to Pete next, a question about adoption. Yeah, thanks, Sylvia. So one of the, the one of the things to note is that this isn't this we haven't taken this to its conclusion yet. We're at a prototype stage, so as an approach, it's not complete. Um, so there are various kind of mechanisms for doing innovation in MSF. Some of them are funds, and one of them is called the Sapling Nursery, which is run from the UK. And one of the criticisms of the Sapling Nursery is it gives you time and it gives you money, and then that's it. So if you are coming from the field and you're a logistician with an idea. You're given X amount of euros and you're given X amount of months and off you go. So we see this possibly as being kind of a recipe that can help people within MSF to make more of the time and money that, that is available to them. Um, but we've, we've just, just kind of finished doing it. So what the next steps are, I, I don't know. Doc documenting it is, is, is important and making it available and, and showing, it, showing what can be done maybe and, and talking about how to develop it further. Thank you. And Andreas, the last couple of questions then around uh, scoping challenges. And yes, uh, the, the scoping challenge. Uh, do you hear me, by the way? Yeah. Uh, well, let's create, you know, clean water for everyone, very broad. Uh, if you and code whatever you want for 24 hours, I mean, that happens that people do make -thons and hackathons with those kind of very broad challenges. I think. Um, you know, as the overall headline for the for the thon, that might be the thing, but. To scope it down to you know the specific context, the specific constraints. What kind of uh, are we talking rural Nigeria? Are we talking this small village? Are we talking you know city, big cities? And, and what are we talking about? And and basically having clear scenarios, I would say, is, is a good way of doing it because in those particular scenarios, you can find a way to to talk. Okay, we now talk about this specific person or this mother of of two and the specific things rather than, you know, solving climate change uh, in, in a workshop. So I, that's a suggestion uh, for me. Uh, when it comes to this uh, moving up the ladder a bit, uh, for example, missing maps and, and other activities that you might get initial enthusiasm and then you've done it once and you might not come back or, or that kind of stuff. I think that's, uh, at least from the people I talked to, that's a huge problem, obviously. But one thing that I heard that some are talking about is you need to allow these enthusiasts as well to kind of create their own kind of hacks or, 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 or make a and that kind of stuff. So you're not controlling everything and everything needs to be done by MSF or everything needs to be done because you're afraid that they will run off with your brand. I mean, if you will give them some freedom as well to, to, to do that, then I think Missing Maps have done. Uh, been able to spread the word, so to speak, but in general to allow people that are super enthusiastic to kind of create their own uh, you, you know, makeathons and hackathons, that seems to be quite successful because then they feel ownership and not only like I'm a participant. So um, I'll, I'll wrap up now. Thank you to the panel. It's clear that MSF has a lot of opportunity to find innovations in ways the market hasn't quite solved. And I guess that, that some of the lessons here are around taking those learnings forward and making sure we can move beyond prototype for some of those great ideas. Uh, thank you for your questions. And now I'll pass over to Javid. Yes, thank you all. Wasn't that an incredible session about learning about innovation? I think um, some potential game changers there and real frameworks about which to bring innovation along. So round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>